This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. You know, as we grow as leaders and build a strong culture in our business, we take on many, many different roles. These are unwritten roles that many small business people need to know that they may have to step into, such as a marriage counselor, a person of faith, an intervention confidant, and more. From the Aftermarket Radio Network, this is Carm Capriato, and I'm with Dr. Dave Wyman, a great and wise contributor to the podcast, as we discuss the management of all the different hats we put on as business owners. Hey, thanks to our partner, Napa, for providing you this episode. You know, since its relaunch in 2020, the Napa Auto Care member site has continued to evolve to keep members updated on all the Napa programs, promotions, benefits, and other information available to help their business thrive. If you're a Napa Auto Care member, visit member.napaautocare.com to access the member portal. If you're not a Napa Auto Care Center, it may be your time. Contact your servicing Napa Auto Parts store or salesperson to learn more about how to join the Napa family. Hey, a warm welcome and always, always honored to have Dr. David Wyman on the program. Hello, Dr. David. Hello, Carm. Great to be with you again. Thank you, sir. Uh, psychologist Wyman Consulting. D- David, I don't know if you're keeping track, but this will be your fourth appearance. It started back in 2020, October of, and we were in the height of that nasty little thing called COVID-19. We talked about stress busters dealing with the emotional roller coaster that I think so many of us were going through. Thank you so much. That was our first. And and then the, the next one was managing holiday stress, which was just this past holiday in December of 21. Thank you for coming on and probably helping a bunch of people through the terror of the holidays. And then uh, handling a toxic employee was January of 2022, which I so appreciate that because we have to deal with that. There's no season associated with that. (laughs) That's, That's really good. So, you know, I think the world knows I'm a thinker and there's nothing that I hear, see, feel. How does it relate to the world that we live in, in the, here in the automotive aftermarket. And I was thinking about roles. So let me, let me read you, uh, my greatest, gracious audience, uh, the email that I sent to Dr. David. I said, David, I had a thought. Not sure this is for you, but as we grow as leaders and build a strong culture in our business, we take on many different roles. There are unwritten roles that many small business people need to know that uh, they may have to step into. Oh my God, I got to fix cars, greet customers, and... Roles such as marriage counselor, brother, sister, mom, dad, friend, person of faith, intervention, a confidant, and more. And you probably know a whole bunch more. So I said, would this be a fascinating and informative episode? And I think it took you a matter of one minute to reply. (laughs) And you said, yeah, absolutely. So thank you for being here. I, I think this is so important. And I think that's one of the challenges that many of us as small business owners face on a daily basis. Um, If you're paying attention to your people, you're trying to be a great leader, build a good culture, you have to step into many roles. You do. And some of those you chose, you chose to mentor somebody. That's one that you chose, but there could be others that you didn't choose. (laughs) And, And that doesn't mean that they're not appropriate, but sometimes we're the one putting that out there. And other times somebody's asking for it from us. There's just an endless variety and an endless combination based on what's going on in any particular business. So why do we have to have all these different roles? I think that part of it is if you're in a service business and the business that your folks are involved with, I would argue there's products that are part of that. But even then, there's the service that's part of that. And the service isn't the technical skill of doing something so much as it is to me how the person feels when they left, because most customers of an automotive business have no idea what's going on when they left their car there. They just don't. They don't have have a way of understanding that. In fact, I was was talking to an old timer right before he retired and he said, I don't know, it's all computers now. (laughs) he, He liked turning wrenches back in the day and that still happens. But for him, he was saying, wow, like if you really know the technology, that's an advantage. Um, in in the business because so many things are related to that. But but I do think that it's a service and and maybe there's more layers to it than folks realize, even the customer coming in. But having 
sat in so many shops while I was waiting. If they had a TV up on the wall, I wasn't watching the TV. I was watching the interactions that they had with customers and with one another. And you really do see all of these opportunities to step in. Somebody's bringing up a financial issue or somebody's bringing up something that happened uh, with their, their partner or their spouse. And you can see the roles. You can even see the expression on people's faces change, the leader's face change. Uh, sometimes while he's listening to something, he might roll his eyes like, oh, he's talking about that again. Uh, other times they lean in and, you know, they're in, and sometimes I wonder if that space that's behind the counter it's not just a business space. Sometimes that's a confession booth, you know, or sometimes that's a financial advisor's little office back there. So there's so many things that happen behind the counter that are not just leading the business or answering technical questions. You know what I just realized? You never turn it off. You're always working. It's an occupational hazard. <laughs> um, if you're a dentist, and you're, you're off duty, you're not necessarily seeing inside someone's mouth and counting the cavities. But you and I both, because I, I think this applies to you as well. I think there's so much rich information in the environment that it's hard when you're sitting in a business not to observe that or not to watch it. But I also have noticed, I think this is true of you. I know it's true of me. I appreciate these magic moments that happen where you can see that somebody hit it out of the park or they were really paying attention to what somebody else wanted or needed. And I do believe pretty strongly from knowing you that you have this kind of servant leader mentality. How can I help other people? How can I serve other people? That connects the business to our own person, uh, personal values and purpose. But it's true. I think when I'm, when I'm walking around, I, I do notice what's happening in a professional environment, whether I'm just dropping the car off and watching what's happening among people or it's in any other kind of business that I'm that I'm dealing with. I've always heard of it. If you're clutching onto the counter, that is your crutch. And and sometimes you end up becoming an expert that you don't necessarily should be in the face of the customer. But, you, you know, I guess if you watch the white knuckles of certain people, you'll get an idea of what type of, quote unquote, authority or their comfort zone. So. I'm an owner and I say, I've got to be a friend of my employees, but no, I learned that you can't be friends of them. There needs to be a distance. And I know shop owners that are adored by their people because they did drop the veil of a hierarchy. Now, what's your opinion of that? I think that we're always doing that even in our personal lives. There was a study that was written up in the Wall Street Journal a few uh, few months ago that was about the tendency of people to not keep secrets if the secret they were told offends them somehow morally. Then you think, well, I confided in that person because I thought I could trust them. But in this study, and it was just a study, this isn't real life, but in the study, about a third of the people said, if I found like the behavior that was being shared with me super offensive, yeah, I, I might reveal that. Like, I, I might tell someone else. I think it's not just in the work life where we're kind of measuring how much is it okay to share with that person or talk to them about my personal life or share something that might put us more on the friend footing than the leader and employee or owner and employee setting. I do believe that we're always doing that in life and that work is a very particular kind of context because you are writing that person's paycheck your name appears on that, unless it's a corporate entity and still somebody signing it. Um, and you have hire and fire authority over that person. But I do feel like the way that we strengthen relationships at work is not by being more professional, it's by being more personal. We don't strengthen that by saying to the person, listen, I just want to remind you, my name's on your paycheck every other week or once a month or every week or whenever it is. I think we strengthen that by asking them how they're doing and really listening to the answer. And paying attention to that. You just talked about authoritative because I signed your paycheck. I got to jump backwards just a minute when you said in confidence. And, you know, in that survey you talked about, if you're going to be a confidant to an employee because you care about what's going on in their world, not only their business world, but in their family world, because family world stuff comes to work. Without question. And it could have a major effect on his performance, her, his or her performance, and your business and your customers, that to me, that confidence can't 
be breached, David? It should never be breached. And one of the things that they found in that in that study was that it was best to confide in people who were compassionate and who shared our moral values. Well, you might spend more time with someone at work than you do with someone at home. <laughs> and in the field that you're in, this particular area, most people who are coming in aren't happy necessarily. Like there's a stress associated with being in, for example, repair part of this business because nobody's coming in because everything's fine. People are coming in because something's wrong. They walk in the door stressed. And so the ability of people to trust one another, to count on one another, to feel like they can blow off steam without the boss coming down on them is really important. And even in some ways developing kind of a coded or sacred language that exists just within a shop, for example. What the terms for different things that are going on, the language that people use that shows that we're connected in a very specific way. This is how we talk about things in our shop. Those things, even nicknames for things or people, that creates a, this kind of connection that's super important. Hey, Carm here. Just to let you know that Napa Auto Care was top rated in a national survey by consumers of car repair in the chains and independent repair shops category. Ratings were based on courtesy, timeliness, quality, price of repair, and percent of times the problem was fixed on the first visit. Napa Auto Care is the only banner program to make these ratings. Consumers are familiar with the Napa Auto Care brand, and you can benefit. Napa Auto Care has the largest network of independent professional shops in North America with over 17,000 locations. Your independent repair facility can join this network and be supported through Napa's national marketing through the already successful Know How for All campaign, which promotes auto care specific offerings. You also get support to promote your local repair facility with targeted media in local markets and in proven channels. You can also utilize a full calendar year of promotions with Napa Auto Care sales driver promotions that are 100% fully funded by Napa. And this includes free email marketing, digital and print point of sale materials. Also connect a national presence by co-branding your locally known brand with the nationally recognized Napa brand. Also partner with Napa Smart Sign to educate customers with engaging video that tell the why behind the needed repair or service. You can access editable digital menu boards, template builder tools, social media feeds, and integrations with other auto care program elements. Also offer a credit solution to customers with Napa Easy Pay Consumer Financing. Stay top of mind with your business name embossed on the credit card. Also have an online presence when consumers search for a local repair facility on Napa Online, which generates millions of views per month at no additional cost. Hey, if you're interested in partnering with Napa Auto Care and capitalizing on the Napa Know How for All national marketing campaign, contact your salesperson or servicing Napa Auto Parts store. Let's talk about jumping into a role of a counselor, being zero qualified to do that. And someone comes, uh, closes the door and says, hey, boss, I need some advice. I guess when I think of that happening, the trust relationship needs to be there. If not, they would probably not be asking. But the been there, done that wisdom card must be there because now I'm asking someone for guidance and help, maybe give me a direction, a new idea, uh, point me down a different pathway or something. I would have to say that majority of people that started a business just aren't prepared for <laughs> right. that. Any advice on when it happens next? It's a huge compliment if an employee asks to talk to you privately and share something that's bothering them, because it means that they trust, use that word trust, they trust you already because they started that conversation. Because if you think about it, it's not like somebody thinks it and immediately does it. Usually they're thinking, geez, should I go to Carm with this or not? Should I talk? And maybe they've seen other people come talk to you and leave seeming like they're doing better when they left the conversation and they went in. That's really important. That To me, that's a huge compliment that somebody would ask for that conversation. And I think that sometimes we may feel too much pressure to actually provide a solution when that may not be what the person wants. So in my own life, when people call me like friends or family, they say, I want to talk about something. I, I need to talk about something. 
I say, okay, I got three services I can offer you. Number one, I can tell you what I really think about what you're saying. Number two, I can listen and only say positive things about what you're doing or what you're planning. And number three, I can just listen the whole time. Carm, the majority of people say, I'll take number three. I just need <laughs> someone to hear this. And I think, oh, all that education went for nothing. But, but I do think that when they come in with the idea that they, they, they want to share something with you, and it might be personal, might be financial, could be a relationship, could be a change that they're looking, maybe they're thinking about moving across the country and surfing all day instead of working the rest of their lives. And now that I mention that, it's not a bad idea. But anyway, that all by itself, it's creating a certain kind of connection there that they brought to the table. Um, and I think that's really important. And in life, we often have what I would call sort of our personal board of directors around us. But often that's a boss. That person is perceived as they're running the business. They must have, you know, taken that risk at some point. They must know what they're doing. I keep getting a paycheck. Uh, I may like the way they handle situations or handle people. And I feel like, hmm, maybe they know something I could learn. Mm -hmm. You just hit the L word, the, the listener word. Again, every time we talk, you spark these incredible ideas of, of my past or my stories. And I'll never forget calling my dad once and saying, hey, listen, I want to stop by and chat with you. I have this issue I want to talk about. I walked into the room. And I said to him, could you do me a favor and just listen? Because he was, he would within 30 seconds tell me, <laughs> tell me what I should do. <laughs> maybe that's a dad thing. And maybe I even have to work on that. I don't know. My dad listened within a minute and a half. I solved my problem by talking it out. In your entire business, everybody's a problem solver. That's just the mind of a person who does this for a living. There's a problem and you're figuring out a solution to it. In the moment where somebody's coming in to talk, it is super helpful to find out what they want to get out of that conversation. Because they may say that they need help, figure, like they want a solution. But to your point, you were able to articulate exactly what you wanted out of that conversation. Not everybody can do that. It's certainly something that the owner can say, I want to make sure you're getting what you need out of this conversation. Like, what's what do, what do you want to get out of this? Um, and I proactively offer solutions. Um, because I want to be clear about what this is about so that if, if it's not to help them solve the problem, I can shut that part of my brain off and say, okay, just listen. So would you recommend that if someone comes to you for, hey, hey listen, uh, I, I got some issues. I need to talk to you about them. Don't rush to want to be this problem solver. Rush to be the listener. I guess I would clarify what they're hoping to get out of that conversation so that I know what kind of mindset to be in. So if they say, I'm looking for solutions, then I still might be tempted, and I think you were alluding to this earlier, to ask questions about what they've thought about doing. Have they ever been in a situation like this before? And if so, what did they do? What would they do if there were no rules? Because if I'm giving them answers and they try that answer and it doesn't work, they blame me. If I give them answers and they try that answer and it does work, they can't take credit for it because I'm the one who gave it to them. So I have a, somewhat of a bias to asking questions so that they, just to see, can they discover this on their own? Do they already have ideas? Sometimes I'll ask people, who else have you talked to about this? And if they say everyone in my life, <laughs> then that's helpful information to know. If they say, I haven't talked to anybody about it, you're the first person. That's helpful information, too. So I don't think you can ever go wrong by asking questions to learn more and to see what their options are. So the first part of that is, hey, what's the goal of the conversation? The second part of the conversation is going to be them telling you stuff. The third part of it could be helping them explore options and giving your own solution if that's something that they want. But I wonder how often... Like you just, you described it so perfectly. I kind of figured it out myself when I was talking to my dad about it. Like to give people that opportunity to create some space for that, because so often in life, the people who are coming to us have already gotten a ton of ideas from other people who very generously just showered them with options. But if, if that's all they wanted, then they wouldn't be coming to us. So that's why that question of who else have you talked to about this? You might, you know, it's, it's interesting to see what did they get out of those conversations because they might say, oh, they just told me what I should do, but that's not really what I'm looking for. And Dr. David, I felt confused and uh, directionless 
even though I had been going over in my head this entire issue over and over, and but I never articulated it. I never made, it's almost in my mind, I set up an outline to a strategic solution or something <laughs> crazy. And when I spoke it, it almost changed my perception of a solution instead of thinking it. Well, you're bringing up something important, which is when we're talking and we're listening at the same time to what we're saying, we're informing ourselves. And that's why so often people talk their way into the solution when we're there with them as a sounding board, not necessarily giving them feedback or advice or anything else. Why do people feel better when they journal something? Well, they got it out and they're looking at it now and that's interacting with their brain as they, hmm, maybe today didn't really suck. Like these other good <laughs> things happened today too. Um, but there is something about that idea of thinking out loud, you know, that matters, that matters. What about the parent sibling counselor thing. I mean, if someone comes to you and you you do ask the questions to keep it more on them, but they're unwilling to talk. So you really need to somehow encourage that discussion and maybe, maybe be a counselor in this case. Yeah. And these different things you mentioned, like parent or sibling, I think people are looking for these kinds of things in life in general. So many times when someone feels really good about somebody, they'll be like, you're like the sibling I never had. You know, you're the brother or sister uh, that I always wanted but didn't have. And the other person says, but you have four siblings. <laughs> like, yeah, but I don't have one like you. Like, you would have been great as a brother. The term brother from another mother or the sister from another mister, the idea that people feel connected to somebody else in a sibling-like way or seeing someone like an aunt or an uncle or a parental figure, that's where I think it's okay for the owner to kind of go with their gut. And if they feel like the person needs dad to talk to, okay, I can do that. When I was a kid, my Uncle Sam was awesome because Uncle Sam didn't have any rules or limits and you could tell him anything. But I didn't feel that way about my father. I mean, my father was okay in, in his categories, but Uncle Sam was the guy, he would like, he would tell you like stuff you needed to know in life with no, no limits. So I think in my own world, I've recognized that for my own nieces and nephews, I'm always positive. I listen more than I talk. That to me is the uncle thing. The father thing looks very different because that might be more parental, more authoritarian. That That is a different feel to it. But sure, people, I think, unconsciously view us these ways because we might remind them of that parental figure or remind them of the parental figure they wanted, but they didn't have. And so we, we can't escape that. But it, it's awesome for the owner in that position to realize that somebody sees you in these other ways, I think is, is very rich. It creates more uh, there, there's, there's more connections that are possible there. And that creates a stickier organization. And I think a healthier one. What just came to my mind was there are so many father, son, father, daughters in our industry, small business America. And can you shed any light on, on the, the importance of those roles? I think that the kind of trust that gets developed within a family is so interesting and creates a core there. And there's a personal finance guru, Dave Ramsey, who talks about these, these, this very issue. And he said that, um, so his daughter and I think one of his sons works in the business. And he said, the way they decided to handle this is that at work, he's Dave. And at home, they call him dad. And they've created that distinction there. No matter what these relationships are, being conscious and aware and talking about how do we want to handle this. And I worked in a family business for 12 years and it was super interesting. And we did talk about how am I going to address the owner who was my aunt in meetings and how would we handle things when we were at like a family event and decisions about what were we going to talk about work outside of work or not and how we dealt with that. I think we did a pretty good job of maintaining those boundaries, but the more family members there are, the more relationships are going on and the trickier it can be. I've seen the father and son connection in, in businesses and there's just a level of trust there. And you can kind of see the mentoring going on in the way that the, the older generation is handling a question or a customer. And you almost get the sense that they're not just dealing with a customer in the moment, 
they recognize that their child is over there too, and they're, you know, that they're modeling how they would like things done. To me, that trust in the family business, the, the family relationships, it compensated for any emotional upset that would occur because I felt slighted in some way if that ever happened, or like, well, why are they treating me like this? Like, I'm the nephew here or the cousin. I worked with my cousin in the same business. I think what is so important in our industry today is the role evolution. So you got father, you got son, father, daughter, you got father, two sons, father, son, daughter, whatever it is. There's a point where dad, you need to stop being the boss and you need to anoint people's roles and responsibilities. Now, some some relationships don't last because too tight to the vest, always wanting to be the boss. And that doesn't help someone grow as a leader. And, and you, so you need to be there. It's almost like there needs to be a change of a role as the they earn it. And the best way to make that happen is to plan for it. There shouldn't be surprises around that. <laughs> Dad shouldn't come in one day and tell his daughter, oh, okay, now you're in charge of all the computer systems. <laughs> like, what? I had no desire to do that. Why don't we hire someone to do that? The conversations are really important. It is super hard for people, particularly if they were the founder of the business, to kind of let go of things. It absolutely has to happen, like you, you said it perfectly. And sometimes it's an outsider who is guiding that process because that older generation has a very difficult time doing what you just said. How many owners today, yeah, it doesn't matter how what their age is, they didn't go to school for learning this. It was like someday, well, when I die, they'll figure it out. That's the wrong attitude. <laughs> right. That's, that's, let's give them a giant problem that's emotionally charged to have to deal with. And I just won't say anything <laughs> about what I want. So this kind of succession planning concept, particularly when it's a family business, is super helpful. And a lot of times the... The idea that what I want to transfer to my kid is not necessarily what they want is important. And in my work, I have found a lot of times the younger generation feels like the older generation never asked them what they want or what they envision. Um, those conversations are super important because the younger generation is thinking it. Not asking them doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So asking about that and learning about that and seeing where they want to be in the future. Where do you want to be five years from now? Where do you want to be three years from now? We're then backing it down to an even um, a shorter time horizon is, is really helpful. And I think that there's a way to honor the values of the older generation because those tend not to change while recognizing that technology is changing, customer uh, requirements and expectations are changing and a multi-generational business can be very rich in resources and ideas for meeting those client needs in a, in a unique way that a kind of a corporate setting, uh, it's harder to, to do that in a big corporation than it is in a smaller business. Tracy come on board a year ago and she, incredibly important part of the business. She had her first podcast just a couple of weeks back. Awesome. She surprised me with it because I've been trying to encourage her to do it. But so many people have come up to me at events, uh, even through email. So what are your plans now that you've got Tracy on board? And so I think it is so important uh, to have these discussions, and, and we have. My thinking goes to the children in the business. If the parent just doesn't seem to have that get up and go and discussion period to, to talk about three years, five years, ten years, I would believe you would recommend help break the parent down by you sitting down. I mean, if the parent doesn't want to be proactive, shouldn't the role of the son or the daughter step up? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's weighing the risk of having that conversation with the benefit of having that conversation. And if they've seen dad explode because something got burnt on the barbecue grill, they might not want that to happen in the shop. So they have all these other images or experiences um, to think about. But, but I do think ultimately these risks need to be taken in a way and to have these constructive – and it's more than one conversation, obviously. It's a series of conversations about what the future of the business would look like. But let's face it, succession planning is important anyway. Like, you should be doing this anyway, think about the future of the business. Where do we want to be? Who can step up? Who's looking to leave because they don't want to do this anymore? Or who's looking to leave because they're kind of, like, physically they're tired of the work, um, even if they're not retirement age, uh, which I'm aware of recently where 
somebody who was used to a certain uh, mechanic at a shop. She showed up one day and he was gone. She said to the owner, but he wasn't that old. <laughs> and the owner said, I know, like, I feel the same way. Like we, he wasn't a retirement age person, but he had hit the point where he just wanted to do something else. And so he did, but that's where succession planning is important. Learning about the future that people have envisioned for themselves. And in that family structure too, there's a lot of extra pieces to that uh, that make it a little harder to have that conversation. But man, when you do have it, everybody should feel more relieved at every level because they had the discussion. They're afraid of their answer. Are you trying to move me out? Exactly. (laughs) The siblings should never say in front of dad, what are we going to do with pop? (laughs) Like that's... But they don't know what else to say because they've been avoiding the question too. Yeah. And imagine the fear that you have that your kids are going to squeeze you out of a business. Like that's pretty deep. The more that people get accustomed to talking about this, the better. Listen, sometimes the accountant is looking over the books and has done some year end numbers and and might bring it up like, oh, you know, I notice you've been paying Bill Jr. the same amount for six years. Like, have you thought of increasing that? Because I don't know if he can live on that. But sometimes it's the accountant. Sometimes it's an attorney who's doing an estate plan and says, oh, I know there's a family business and your daughter Jill is involved. What are your plan? Like, how could you make sure that uh, that that continues to her benefit? So it could be an insurance broker. It could be the bank. It could be the attorney. It could be the the uh, accountant. Some of those professionals, by the way, that I know are very reluctant to bring up these personal issues because they don't feel prepared to handle it. So they might bring it up because it's part of an estate plan or it might be part of something the accountant's looking at, but they generally are not super comfortable doing that. And sometimes they'll refer that person to me and then I am comfortable doing that. You and I are very comfortable doing that. They should refer them to you too. But yeah, having those conversations there's, there's definitely a lot of fears and concerns, but hopefully as they start to talk, they realize those are irrational. I'm thrilled that we are covering this because how many times have, have people said to me, either through email or face to face, the wife or the husbands, they're driving down, they're listening to the show and they're slapping each other on the arm. Because they know that something that we're talking about is going on in their world and in their life. So thank you for bringing this up because I'm not sure we're talking about it enough. You know, the succession is so critical. And it shouldn't start when uh, your mom and I want to slow down uh, at the end of the year, which that's just so many months. And uh, and again, the pay is low, uh, the, the training, the, the evolution of authority, all of that, you know, is, if you will, mask behind door number two that I've never given you the key for. I think we've done well, but doesn't all of this fall under servant leadership? I really believe it does. Um, There's in in Don Barden's book, The Perfect Plan, which is about selling like high end, like, you know, multi, multi multi-million dollar services. And and what do you learn from that um, if you're in, in in a business? But he asked a lot of these business leaders, he really admired what they did. And instead of saying, we make medical devices or we run whatever it is. They said, I serve other people and that the business is the mechanism by which they do that. And so I really believe that this is it, in the, in the folks that I've resonated with the most in my own career, when I was working for a company and I was the vice president of marketing of that publishing company, I mentioned the family business, um, or when I was a copywriter or an account executive for an ad agency, you could almost, I could tell instinctively who was there because they wanted to help other people get from one point to a better point and who was there just to make a buck and it didn't matter what they were doing. Like they were a mercenary for hire, you know, and you could hire them to do whatever. Uh, it, they would they would do whatever it took, but the values weren't really there. So I do believe when we reflect on that idea of serving other people that it naturally connects other people to us. Um, I can't think of a business where the the that servant mentality hasn't resulted in long-time customer connections. And I can see a lot of examples where they treat customers like it's another number and a transaction to have, and they don't have a following. They, they might get new customers driving down the street, having a problem. That's the place where they pull in because it's right there, but they don't have the long-term customer base. You, you can't put a value on that because 
those long-term customers, there's no marketing expense associated with them. They're doing the marketing. They're not only coming to you without you paying a dime to get them, but they're spreading the word for you. When you see people reacting to the servant style of some businesses and how loyal they are, they can't be pulled away. Taking it out of the automotive field just for a minute, why are there some independent pharmacies that are thriving because they created those connections years ago and now it's paying off and it's, it matters. So it matters to some customers. So there has to be a fit there. But yeah, I think that servant mentality is super important. Draw the parallel to our great, strong, top independence in our industry and the kind of business that they have, the locations that they're growing into. And everybody says, well, why don't you take your car to the dealer? Well, you just don't understand. You know, uh, Dave takes care of me. You know, my my car's always perfect. They always explain it. They always get me in. Uh, I've never had an issue. Did I mention the word trust? All of that lens and all, all that goes into servant leader mentality. Can we be over-consumed with all the roles that we have to play? Yeah. And, and I think that if you start to feel overstressed, a little burnout, that could be a sign that you're doing too many roles too much of the time. Um, and so the first step is just being aware of this. In any given moment, is this the fifth time this person's come in to talk to me about their finances, who works for me? And if so, Am I the financial advisor too much right now? Why am I feeling like over overtaxed? Uh, because it could be that there are roles that are just being used too much. It's not that there shouldn't be these multiple roles. You and I both know, even if we're not conscious of it, people are seeing us that way. But that awareness of it is really important. Who am I in that moment? And uh, if I'm feeling like a little overstressed by all this, where are the priority roles? And so how do I make sure that I'm in the moment in that role and that in the other roles that people might be pulling for, I'm dialing it back effectively. So an example, just picking up on what I was mentioning before is if somebody's coming to me over and over again, they're getting ready, you know, they, they want to buy a house eventually and they keep asking me my opinion about it. And should they go with a certain amount of money down or should they try some other way? Like they're, they're talking to me about this financial decision. I may at some point refer them to somebody who actually does that for a living and say, hey, you know, I know a real estate agent who might help you think through the financial part of it. How interested might you be in talking to that person? Because we might be getting beyond my expertise area. So that's a, that's an example of, hey, I'm kind of playing this role of financial advisor. It might be expanding beyond where I'm comfortable doing it, or I think they're asking me too much about this spending too much time or energy on it, how do I refer them to somebody else in a nice way so they don't feel like, I'm like, hey, I'm just sick of, like, buy the house already, leave me alone. <laughs> but, um, you know, how do we manage that so that if we feel like, you know, I think I'm spending too much time like doing marriage counseling in the shop, like that, that we have other resources that we can use or at least suggest that the person pursue other resources that would help them. So I'm the owner of the shop. One of my people come to me and I end up with this incredible half hour discussion that gets me really concerned on the quality of life, what this person is leaving to go home to, incredibly confidential things that I found out. And I decide to get him some help that I know I can't, I can't help with. And, and they take that help on. I may even help through insurance or something to, to help get it covered because I care so much about this person, what they've given to me, the years they've spent, the quality of work, the, the role that they play in, in a leadership role in my business. They are their core for me. I want to get out from under this because it is also taking a tax on me to be worried about that individual. It's now three weeks down the road. Dr. David, do I bring that person in and say, how's it going? I guess I'm curious, are, are they still with this counselor? Are they still solving their problem? This is an awesome question because you don't want to be intrusive and you don't want to reactivate this role of being involved. And so I think you can decide at the point where you're making that referral or saying, hey, I will pay for you know the first three sessions for this to, to, to get started working on it because I really want to support you in this. And you can go from your own values. I don't want to intrude after that because I think this is something that's private for you. 
and I don't want to make a misstep and ask a question at the wrong time. So I hope you're okay with, I will leave it up to you if you want to let me know how it's going, if you want to give me any feedback about the person that you met with or whatever it is. But I feel like it's better for you to decide how to follow up with me. And you might also say, if you want to give me your permission to ask a question at some point in the future, if I'm curious, let me know. But I'd rather you give me that permission now. Um, and you can revoke that. Like, you can revoke that later. But, you know, if if I have a thought about it in a few weeks, uh, is it okay to, to mention that? Because you never know what's going on in somebody's head. And they, they may feel like, they were relieved that they had a chance to talk to you. You made this connection, maybe even provided them with some some help to get that going, but they may want to move on. And so I think it's okay to leave it up to them and say, you know, I'm super comfortable with you moving on with this. And if you want to let me know how it's going in the future, please feel free to do that. But out of respect for your privacy, I probably won't bring it up again because I don't want to be the... I don't, I don't know if that timing would be right for you. And, and I'm I'm perfectly okay with you just letting me know if you'd like to. Work-life balance. Do I take all this stuff home? And now I go home and I have all these roles at home. Uh, it, can you give me any sage advice? The sager advice that I've recognized came from Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he addressed this exact issue because he said, sometimes we feel like we're managing time, but you don't really manage time. You manage yourself. And so he suggested that we create a list of all the roles we have and then the goals we have within those roles and then think about the time we want to spend based on that. So I have a role as a son and I have a parent who's 300 yards down the road from where my office is. And when I first did this and I first did it over 20 years ago, I thought, I don't know if I'm doing such a good job in the son department. Like, I think I'm a good brother. My brothers and I talk a lot. And so I just made some tweaks like, okay, I'm deaf. I'm going to call my parents to go see them once a week. So that addresses this. What he, what he felt like is when we only look at it as managing time, then what, what happens is we try to squeeze our roles into what's left over after we've done all this other stuff. If we think about the roles first, then the goals, and we think about time after that, then we feel more balanced. And so I hope that answers the question that you asked because I do, for me personally, when I wrote all the roles out that I have, I thought, man, you know, it wouldn't take much for me to, you know, like call my brothers once a week and just check in on them. Why aren't I doing that? I don't have enough time. Well, I do have the time. I've just chosen to use it differently. So when I looked at it from the roles first, it made it a lot easier to, to do all the things that I wanted to do, but still make sure that those roles were in balance and, and getting, you know, getting fulfilled. I'm honored to have you on and have this wonderful open discussion that we've had on, on roles, uh, all, all these different roles that we play. And for you to bring the perspective, uh, the reality uh, down to us as to what we have to do to fill them. I, uh, I just loved it. Thank you for taking my email a, a little bit ago and, and for uh, having your fourth ep podcast with us uh, and, and for helping you know, all the great listeners that we have in the automotive aftermarket uh, take it up a notch or, or three. Well, thanks for being here, Dr. David Wyman. Wyman Consulting, um, uh, another knocked it out of the park episode, man. Thanks. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.